Here's an idea. Let's explore the meaningful difference between reviews and criticism. In March of 2015, here on Idea Channel, we talked about The Sims and gender performance. And I talked about how, even though The Sims has always been a socially progressive game series, at the time, each player's semi-autonomous people pets had to adhere to the gender binary for seemingly no reason other than because. And in spite of the fact that a masculine sim in a dress is not exactly absurd, even in The Sims' own terms. Well, as of June 2016, that is no longer the case. This sim gets to wear a cute tank top. This sim gets to wear a tuxedo. You want high heels? Done. Cargo pants, all yours. Except, I mean, cargo pants, really? Okay, you do you. Who am I to judge? Cargo pants for everyone. You can still create a male or female sim, but there are more options if you want them. You can create a sim with a masculine or feminine frame, with a preference for masculine or feminine clothing. You can decide if your sim can get other sims pregnant, get pregnant themselves, or neither. And you can choose how your sim uses the toilet. And all of these things can be changed at any time. Instead of, say, providing a slider with strictly male and strictly female on either end, or a litany of radio button options for all potential gender identities, Max's solution to their gender trouble treats gender as a set of lower level decisions. Your sim's gender doesn't have to be a top-down choice that determines what they are. Their gender emerges from a number of decisions based on how they appear and what they do. So instead of saying what your sim's gender is, you make decisions about things that tend to signify gender. And one decision doesn't dictate the next. Your sim can look male, dress masculine, pee standing up, and get pregnant. Your sim's gender also emerges unlabeled. After deciding some characteristics, the game doesn't pop up clippy style and say, looks like you're trying to make a trans woman. It just lets your sims live unlabeled. Effectively, Maxis's solution demonstrates the ways gender is perceived based on persistent, though by no means permanent, actions, preferences, and appearances, i.e. performance. It also hints at how such an understanding can meaningfully exist outside of language and taxonomies. It's possible, and in many situations maybe preferable, to understand non-gender conforming sims, and humans for that matter, without preoccupation over what gender expression subheader they fit into and how that subheader relates to their anatomy. Of course, it would be great if Idea Channel could take credit for these adjustments, but that would be very unfair. Lots of people have written many thoughtful and much more visible things about this game, which has a massive and massively diverse following. And they've been doing that since long before we came along. Critics and fans have written and made videos about the game's treatment of gay marriage, same-sex parenting, and even restrictions on Sims' names and descriptions. And in each case, Maxis has listened, responded, adjusted, and improved. In effect, this is the purpose of criticism, not to tear down, but to gesture towards what has yet to be built and encourage its construction. There can be an aspect of disappointment, it's true, but disappointment and deep abiding respect aren't mutually exclusive. They're frequently a package deal. It's often what critics love the most that they want the best from. Dig into most criticism and the first thing that you learn is the people who have high expectations for something are invested in its success, not its failure. I'm gonna suggest a rhetorical distinction, and one that I think is important. A review is concerned with how something is. Criticism is about what it is, how it functions, and what it does, both itself and to us. The former makes a judgment of something's worthwhileness. The latter takes its worthwhileness as granted, which is exactly what makes it worthy of criticism. When games generate reviews, it's a sign that they are for sale. When games generate criticism, it's a sign they're important, impactful, and influential. The Sims is, Prison Architect is, Dark Souls Inside, Kentucky Route Zero, No Man's Sky, and Overwatch are, so they generate criticism. And similarly, RimWorld is yet another impactful game, and criticism surrounding it has, in the recent past, generated some debate. I'm not going to get into the details, links in the doobly-doo, but the Reader's Digest version is this. RimWorld is a story sim often compared to Dwarf Fortress. You control a small band of colonists stranded on an alien planet who must survive hostile environments and each other for as long as possible. Like Dwarf Fortress and The Sims, you can tell your colonists, or pawns, what to do, but you can't tell them how to feel. And this factors into your success. A sad pawn is a useless pawn. For what it's worth, I really like RimWorld. I have played it a fair amount. RimWorld is unfinished. It's currently in open alpha, and it has one developer, Tynan Sylvester, who you may remember me quoting in our No Man's Sky episode. 
Recently, the conversation around RimWorld got heated when MIT comparative media master student Claudia Lowe wrote for Rock Paper Shotgun about RimWorld in a way similar to, but better and more thoroughly than, how we spoke about The Sims. Lowe, a RimWorld player herself, addresses a problem that is well known to the player community. Straight male pawns repeatedly hit on gay female pawns who turn them down. Barring any changes to the colony, the straight male pawns will repeat their mistake again and again with their mood meter dipping downward each time until they eventually fall into a crippling depression. They may even snap. The situation has spawned a hilariously titled post on the RimWorld subreddit, which, until Lowe's piece, was top voted. Lowe dug into the actual code of RimWorld to see how this attractive lesbian's problem occurs. She was curious how, or if, some social code found its way into game code and she found exactly that. Certain game elements reproduce, in her estimation, non-nuanced assumptions about people who are gay or bi. She found a list of things about how the game treats gender and sexuality, and she thought people would be interested. Her premise is simple. Code is never neutral. Her contention is that RimWorlds is a system whose base structure has literally encoded assumptions about how men and women operate, and that while the causes may be subtle, the effects have an enormous impact on how you play, which does in fact, seem to be the case. Unfinished, temporary, alpha release, known problem, it's all sort of besides the point, she writes, if those impacts are present and being experienced by players, people who exist in the world and are affected by things in it. The code of a game itself may be invisible, but its effects aren't. It represents ideas about how the game world, and to hear Tynan's defense, the real world, operates, and those ideas are then passed on to players through play. Lowe admits most of the time that passing on is fairly benign, but questions whether such is the case in this specific situation. Because RimWorld is impactful, she wants to ask how. Her take is readable and it's interesting, and the back and forth about her piece in the comments and elsewhere is heated. The piece is described as an anger farming witch hunt. There's some discussion of editorial practice and balance. And there's also lots of discussion about the purpose of the piece. To complain? To dissuade people from buying RimWorld? In the end, Lowe doesn't claim that the game is bad or unplayable beyond what has already been widely discussed in the community. She doesn't give it a four out of 10 and say, don't waste your money. She addresses in detail a situation experienced by a plurality of players and its potential impact. And she begins to imagine a version of the game with differently encoded pawn identities. In other words, her work is criticism, not review. But still, there's a vocal contingent which characterizes her work as a hit. There are complaints that Lowe brought politics to a game where previously there were none. And it's that last thing that I want to focus on and conclude with. The idea that RimWorld and other media are politics-free until some enterprising crybaby shows up. I would like to suggest that there is, in fact, no media without politics. Not governmental politics, but politics politics. The distribution and maintenance of power. One way to see if something has politics is to ask, is there money involved? Money and power romp hand in hand through the field of life, so if there's money, there's a power dynamic between people interacting with it. So anything involving money involves power, and viola, it's political. Another way to tell if something is political is if it has an audience. Creators and audience members have differing types and amounts of power. Some, but not all, derived from money, but also visibility, thought leadership, cultural capital. And so the audience slash creator relationship is political. But okay, when someone complains about bringing politics to media, they probably mean identity politics. If I had more time, I might argue that there's no real difference between politics and identity politics, but I don't. And Ollie over at PhilosophyTube already made that video, so base is covered. So what I'm going to say is this. If a piece of media involves people who necessarily possess identities, even if they're fictional, then it has identity politics. What kinds of people the media depicts and how they're depicted involves visibility and audience and all of those other things, so it involves power. And that's why The Sims and RimWorld's treatment of people, even simulated people, is meaningful and subjected to criticism because critics often want the best for what they love. They know games are both powerful and capable of being responsible with that power. To demand that media not be politicized is sort of like demanding that fire not be hot. There may be some possible experience of it where you don't get the thing that you don't want. If you stand far enough away from a bonfire, it's orange, but not warm. If you stand far enough away from video games, it's got people, but no politics. But by their nature, fire hot, media political.
We would, all of us, I think, do well to remember that thoughtful criticism isn't bringing politics, but uncovering it. And it's not a judgment of something's worth, but acceptance and evidence of it. What do y'all think? What are the differences between reviews and criticisms? There will be no comment response video for this furthermore video, but I'm gonna be here. I'm gonna be answering some comments throughout the week. So let me know what you think in the comments below. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts regarding sexy Overwatch fan art. If you wanna watch that one, you can find a link in the doobly-doo or wait for the end screen. We have end screens now. It's nice to be back. I hope everybody had a good two weeks. And for those of you who celebrated Thanksgiving, I hope that you had a fun and um, family filled, if that is what you so choose, Thanksgiving dinner. In case you missed it over the break, my podcast, Reasonably Sound, finally returned from its one year hiatus. So if you want to check that out, there's a new episode out about the type of sound the Inception sound is. And there is going to be a new episode sometime this week uh, about dog whistles and how those work. Another thing to keep an eye out for is that Project for Awesome starts this week and I'm gonna be doing some things with them. So keep an eye on the Project for Awesome Twitter and website to see when I'm gonna be on the live stream and the kinds of perks that we're gonna be giving away. It's gonna be super fun. We have a Facebook, an IRC and a subreddit and the tweet of the week comes from David Gunkel who you may remember us quoting back in one of our AI episodes who points us towards a piece about how it's hard for us to understand our relationship to AI or robots before we more fully understand animals' relationship to us. It's a very interesting read. But then also every tweet from someone like Unique35 who pointed us towards all of the B-movie nonsense that is currently going on on YouTube. We have a whole back catalog of things that we're going to have to get to in 2017. Um, Westworld, The Gilmore Girls, B-movie, all kinds of stuff. It's going to be a busy, it's going to be a busy first quarter. And last, but certainly not least, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without the very hard work of these enterprising crybabies.